Uh, hello, everybody. Hare Krishna. I um, wanted to offer a eulogy to in honor of an old friend of mine who just passed away, Bhakti Madhurya Govinda Goswami. Uh, that was his sannyas name, of course. He, his initiated name from Prabhupada was Makanlal. Makanlal Das or Prabhu. He was initiated in October of uh, 1968 and was one of the first 100 disciples of Prabhupada. Special significance of Makanlal for me, of Bhakti Madhurya Govinda Goswami, is that he was the first devotee that spoke to me about Krishna consciousness. And uh, probably the first devotee that gave me prasadam, the first devotee that invited me to a Hare Krishna program. Uh, he, in 1969, he was resident in the San Francisco temple of Iskand, the fame on Frederick Street, that famous temple where Prabhupada preached so often. And uh, one of the first temples in Iskon. And so he would come over the bridge to Berkeley, uh, usually with another brahmachari, uh, to uh, to preach. The uh, GBC announcement, I'd like to correct, it says that he started one of ISKCON's first university preaching programs at the University of San Francisco in California. That's actually not true. It was at the University of California in Berkeley, California, which is a different city across the bridge from San Francisco. So uh, he, I used to see him on the street and he would, he was very nice. He was a very kind and affectionate person. Uh, he, just a very, really nice person, really nice person. He was always happy to see me because I was one of the few students, I think, that was actually taking a serious interest. And, um, he used to always ask me for donations in a very kind and affectionate way. And so I was a poor student, not, not a starving student, but only like one. Uh, hello, everybody. Hare Krishna. I um, wanted to offer a eulogy to in honor of an old friend of mine who just passed away, Bhakti Madhurya Govinda Goswami. Uh, that was his sannyas name, of course. He, his initiated name from Prabhupada was Makanlal. Makanlal Das or Prabhu. He was initiated in October of uh, 1968 and was one of the first 100 disciples of Prabhupada. Special significance of Makanlal for me, of Bhakti Madhurya Govinda Goswami, is that he was the first devotee that spoke to me about Krishna consciousness. And uh, probably the first devotee that gave me prasadam, the first devotee that invited me to a Hare Krishna program. Uh, he, in 1969, he was resident in the San Francisco temple of Iskand, the fame on Frederick Street, that famous temple where Prabhupada preached so often. And... Uh, one of the first temples in Iskand. And so he would come over the bridge to Berkeley, uh, usually with another brahmachari, uh, to, uh, to preach. The uh, GBC announcement, I'd like to correct, it says that he started one of Iskand's first university preaching programs at the University of San Francisco in California. That's actually not true. It was at the University of California in Berkeley, California, which is a different city across the bridge from San Francisco. So uh, he, I used to see him on the street and he would, he was very nice. He was a very kind and affectionate person. Uh, he, just a very, really nice person, really nice person. He was always happy to see me because I was one of the few students, I think, that was actually taking a serious interest. And um, he used to always ask me for donations 
in a very kind and affectionate way. And so I was a poor student, not, not a starving student, but only like one or two categories up from starving student. But I used to always give him something. I always thought he was uh, a really nice person. And I believed that what he was doing was truly spiritual, which I did not believe about many other things at that point in life. And uh, actually the first time I visited uh, devotees was when I went to visit him. There was no temple in Berkeley at that time, but there was a lady that had an apartment who invited them to come when they were in Berkeley and stay there, maybe sleep over so they didn't have to go back to San Francisco every night. And uh, in those days, there was tremendous interest in what you could call new age things or yoga or spiritual things. That was not imagine 1969 in Berkeley. And so I remember when I, they invited me over and it was in Berkeley, not, you know, Berkeley is not a big city. And so I walked over and uh, they were actually reading the Bible and sort of giving Krishna conscious. They were Kamakanlal and this other Brahmacharya were just sitting there when I walked in, they were looking at the Bible and finding Krishna conscious purports for different Bible verses, which I thought was interesting, kind of eclectic. But but and and then the next one of the, another time I can't say the next time because I would see him come little here and there. Another time I saw him where really, actually perhaps this was one of the first times. I mean I'm not putting these in strict chronological order because uh, being a uh, 19, 20 year old, 19 and 20 year old student in Berkeley at that time, I cannot say that I was very lucid, but. I was, um, but it was in that early time, at the end of um, the semester, the end of the uh, spring semester, just before summer vacation in 1969, uh, there was a big truck, huge flatbed, like open in the back truck that was just snaking its way through Berkeley, driving through Berkeley and inviting all the young people to jump on the truck. They were, because they were bringing people up to the beautiful Berkeley Hills above the city where um, there was a free concert, free rock and roll concert in, in the Tilden Meadows, very beautiful open area. And so I jumped on the truck and this was one, like a day or two before I was going to go back home to LA. So when I got up there, the uh, concert, they were just preparing the rock and roll concert and they had these huge speakers, you know, they're like this, like as big as a large building and these big speakers and they were just tuning up and getting all the sound equipment ready. And so they'd given permission to McConnell before the concert started to go on the stage and use the microphone to chant Hare Krishna. So he and his brahmachari uh, associate, I don't remember that other boy's name. I don't think he stayed around a very long time, but, but anyway, um, they went up on this big stage with these, and surrounded by these huge speakers, and they had these cartels, if you want to call them that. They were the kind that you would get, like, for 50 cents at an Indian import store. They weren't like the kinds of cartels we know. They were just like these little brass cymbals, and the sound they made was, uh, you would have to be extremely generous to call it a sweet sound. But anyway, so they had these little these little hand symbols, and uh, so they went on the stage, surrounded by all these big speakers, musicians getting ready, and they started going, you know, king, 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 and, and they were chanting Hare Krishna. And um, I can't say that they were professionally trained singers, um, <laughs> but what really struck me is that you know, given their extremely rudimentary musical instrument and the fact that they were clearly not great singers uh i thought they must really be sincere because this is definitely not about the music i mean they're they're definitely not doing this just for the music and it really struck me how there was no pretension there was no false ego they weren't trying to put on a show they weren't just trying to enter they were just very very sincere and sort of unself-conscious about the level of music they were making, but 
And so somehow that's what struck me. These are very sincere people who are not really concerned about what other people are thinking about them. They're really just trying to share the spiritual um, process. So I had a positive impression. Not, I don't think I ever would have hired them as musicians, but, but I had a very positive impression, and this is so much more important, about their spiritual sincerity. So then after he chanted, when the concert actually started, and uh, there might have been like, you know, out of the many, many hundreds and hundreds of people, there might have been, you know, maybe seven who were not in an altered state of consciousness. But I remember that <clears throat> McConnell was walking just sort of, he was very, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the right word. For those of you who knew McConnell, um, sort of very innocent. I mean, you know, a, a non-devotee might say spaced out. I mean, he wasn't. He was very intelligent. He was an intelligent person, a very good devotee, but just sort of a free spirit and a very nice guy. I keep saying this, but he was very nice. He was very nice. He was very friendly. He was very kind to everyone. And he was just sort of, he was walking from the stage, I guess, to the back of the meadow, which was very large, you know, it was uh, several acres. And, uh, and he was like the Pied Piper. Because in those days, no one had any idea what the Hare Krishna movement was. And people were interested in meditation and yoga and Eastern spirituality. And of course, he was wearing his robes. And he, was, uh, he wasn't walking in a straight line. I think he was just, I just had this image of him just sort of meandering and people coming up to him. And it was really nice because... Because Indian spirituality and all was very new, it was very fresh. People didn't have preconceptions. They were open-minded. They were curious. And so as he was walking, there was a little group following him that just, you know, sort of wanted to be part of this spiritual moment. <laughs> and so, as, and so as, he, as he was making his way through the meadow, he came near me. And somehow rather spontaneously, I just, I just walked up to him. He's close to me. And I said a typical thing that, you know, a non-devotee interested in consciousness elevation would say. <laughs> and we were, I mean, I mean, the scene was very beautiful with these beautiful um, trees and, and, and green grass. And so I walked up, I walked up to him and said, you know, I greeted him and I said, isn't everything beautiful? <laughs> I mean, I was, I was, you know, just, just, uh, turned 20 years old, and I was in Berkeley, you know, away from my parents. And so I just walked up to him and said, uh, isn't everything beautiful? And then what he, what he said stunned me, literally. He said, he just said very simply, yes. So just imagine how beautiful is the source of all this. And uh, my memory to the extent that it's accurate. I remember just that really stopped me. That really, the idea that there's a source of everything. I mean, to, to us, if you're a Hare Krishna, that's like hearing something like that is like about as extraordinary and exotic as breathing or drinking water because, because we, we say that all the time. We're always saying things like that. But back then, no one talked like that. No, I mean... Christians didn't talk like that because they would just give dogma, doctrine, not philosophy. They wouldn't talk about, they would just say, you know, have you been saved by Jesus and all this? They would, they would give their doctrine, but they wouldn't talk philosophy. There wasn't available at that time, at least, I mean, I'm sure it was available. There are many great Christian theologians who were very philosophically sophisticated, but no one read those things. I mean, I mean, we didn't, I mean, scholars, theologians certainly read those things, but it's not something that on the street, so to speak, or on the campus, it's not something that people, people didn't use that kind of language so much. And, this, and the people interested in yoga tend to be metaphysical and, and uh, sort of non-theistic. So the source of everything. And also the fact that it's spoken by a devotee because McConnell, as his name was then, uh, up actually until 2010, that was his name. 
so for uh, 42 years, that was his name. But um, he was a real devotee. He was a very sincere devotee, very faithful, very devoted. And those simple words coming from him, imagine how beautiful the source of everything, that everything comes from. I, I remember it just stunned me, literally, those words. It's the first time I, in my life I heard real Krishna conscious philosophy from a devotee. And I just stood there, you know, just thinking about what he had said. And he moved on. He was just, to me, it was just, you know, he was on his ramble and he was he was just walking about and so he, i'm sure he said little you know gave a lot of little one-liners to a lot of people but it, it it definitely affected me very powerfully so we don't know you know we don't know we can just say a word to someone and i gave no external indication that his words meant very much to me he probably just thought i was just another spaced out student you know just he'd said something to me and i just sort of you know, didn't really answer, and so he kept going. But it really changed my life. And then, and then, uh, I should also mention around that time. This is really kind of like the winter and summer of uh, sixty-eight, sixty-nine. I'm sorry, uh, summer and then winter, summer, fall, and winter. Not summer. Okay, I'm getting on. On track here again. That would have been the, the winter and fall. That's what I meant to say, the winter and fall. Winter and spring. Oh, my God. I am like, I'm thinking so much. You can see I'm still stunned from what he said to me back then. So still so stunned I can't. Okay, I'm going to start paying attention again. Okay, the winter and spring of sort of 1968-69. That was just after he had been initiated. And also, it was probably McConlo. Uh, I don't remembers precisely, but it's very likely, it's very likely it was McConlo that invited me to come and hear Prabhupada. Because I, th because I ran into a devotee, it was very likely McConlo. Uh, in the beginning, first couple of months of 1969, and he invited me to come and hear, he said, my spiritual master is going to speak. And so I went and saw Prabhupada. Of course, that was a super game changer, as they say. So, and, I'm, and McConnell's brother, his older brother, Nara Narayan, um, he and, would join McConnell, I remember in, in the spring of 69, they would give out, they bring these big tubs of sort of fruit salad. It was, you know, it was, sort of typical early ISKCON, it was fruit, yogurt, and a uh, almost an immeasurable amount of sugar. And so, and I remember Narayan and Ryan and McConnell, you know, he would come up to me and, and of course, they didn't bother with Western carmy paraphernalia like plates and spoons or napkins. So they would just, I remember, they would just, Narayan would just, yeah, he would just dig into this big barrel. I mean, he had a barrel of fruit salad. He would just put both hands and he would, he would say, he would say, take, take, this is McConnell's brother. And, I, and so I, I was not accustomed to that form of uh, food delivery. And so, you know, I, I put my hands out. And then he would say, no, take more. And then he would just like, you know, of course, it's dripping through my fingers. All this, you know, very sugary yogurt, but it was good. You know, I was, you know, I was a young guy. I was probably about at least sixteen hours a day hungry, and so, um, <laughs> so a cuddle of, he would come out. And he would chant. They would come out and do kirtan. They would give out prasadam, and uh, yeah, he was just such a nice person. I mean, I have many anecdotes. Some of them, some of them I'll tell, but. Um, and then, of course, I joined the Berkeley Temple when he was there. And, uh, yeah, very, very, just very kind, very nice, affectionate, and uh, very inoffensive, you know, never, and smart. I mean, he was clever. He actually was, um, he had a good sense of humor. He had a very deep laugh. I mean, he would really, you know, he was the kind of person, so to speak, who was easy to laugh. And, you know, he liked, and, and, uh, 
And he, I remember him, now that I'm thinking about it, making sort of really funny, you could say sarcastic remarks about things, but always in, a, in an inoffensive way. You know, it was never malicious, it was never hurtful, but it was just but really funny, sort of laughing at things and uh, dry sense of humor. So he was, um, yeah, an excellent devotee. And then he... Um, of course, after he took sannyas, I, I had very little contact with him. Or, but I know that he preached in. Um, I mean, I think he, he spent a lot of time in India. And uh, it says here, I'll read from the GBC report. He was based out of the Iskon Pun, Punjabi Bog Temple in West Delhi, and had been traveling and preaching energetically, despite his advancing age and deteriorating health in India and other parts of Asia. He was also deeply attached to his Jagannath deities and the Nila Madhava deity and is known for carrying them everywhere. Nila Madhava means blue, blue Madhava. So I think what's really special about Mukangal or, or Bhakti Madhurya Madhava uh, Madhurya Govinda Madhurya Govinda Goswami I, I guess I didn't see him very much after he got his long sannyas name and so then I knew him for you know most of my life as Makanmal so that's why I'm using that name but um, the name probably gave him but I think there's something very special about Makanmal and, and uh, something very special for me I mean apart from his kindness and and how he was instrumental in first introducing me to Krishna consciousness. And so apart from the very special place he has in my own life, I think that because he was not only an early devotee, but the first devotee I really had any, anything like association with, I think he really typified for me and is a symbol for me of a this was a very beautiful, wonderful time in the early days of this con on the West Coast, I should say. I, I wasn't, you know, one of the New York 26 Second Avenue people. I was, I mean, Prabhupada, I joined the movement, or I, 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 I became aware of the movement, or I started to associate with Kundalini with the devotees, probably within a year of, of, you know, the movement sort of starting on the West Coast. So within, within a year, I was in contact with them. And, um, and there was something so wonderful. It was really like Vrindavan. It's just like all of Krishna's pastimes are wonderful, but his Vrindavan Leela is especially ecstatic and beloved. So there's, and I, I've talked about this many times, but there's some way in which um, those early days in ISKCON were like ISKCON's Vrindavan Leela. The movement was very intimate. It was small, of course, or smaller. It was, uh, you know, in, in America, it was, it was really 99% an American Hare Krishna movement. And, and when I would go to a temple, I would meet people who were kind of like me. I understand you could say this bodily concept of life, but Krishna says in the Gita, don't eat too much or too little, don't sleep too much or too little. I'm not, I'm not against diversity. I'm not speaking about that, I mean, for God's sake, but... But there is something nice. It's like if you're traveling in a foreign country and you run into someone from your country or from your city or from your neighborhood, it's, you know, there's something nice about it. There's something nice about it. So uh, we had adopted a very, very different culture. And I'm not talking about just the philosophy, accepting that Krishna is God and the Veda, Veda, Tattva. That, that was the philosophical part that was natural because it was philosophical. There's, there's a way in which, you know, philosophy is not ethic, ethnic. Philosophy has no national boundaries. Philosophy is philosophy. So I would say accepting the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and the beauty of Krishna, that was, that was very natural. But... Of course, you know, the, the very different kind of food and dress and all that stuff uh, was, of course, foreign to me. And, and, it th and there are things I accepted just because it was a package deal. You know, I give the example. It's like if you want to buy 
let's say a um, now let's say you want to buy a writing pen. Does anyone ever buy those things anymore? Let's say you want. Okay, let's say you want to buy a writing pen, and you go to the store, and they only sell them packages of three or five, because they won't sell you one of them anymore. So if you want one writing pen, you only need one. You have to buy three or five, and so they call it a package deal. Like you buy the package, or it's not a deal. And so of course, this kind of those days was a package deal. And especially we were young. I mean, we were just young. We there's no way we could have. I mean, I couldn't have done it alone. I needed the association. So, so you you had to adopt all these very exotic things if you wanted to practice the perfect philosophy in the association of other sincere people. So I think precisely because so much was new and exotic and strange to us. Being able to go through all that with people who are like you, with people who really understood you, because the fact that I could experience all these new and exotic things with people from my generation, people who came from a similar background, people who could really understand me, and I could really understand them, I think that makes it much easier. I mean, obviously it does. It's like you're going to a foreign country, and it's not going to be everything's not going to be easy. But you go with a group of friends; it gives you that support system. People who will always understand you, understand why you're feeling certain ways, because if someone from another culture, they may not understand why I feel a certain way, why I react a certain way. Of course, um, some you know some things are just universal, but some things are not. And so McConnell. Uh, very strongly reminds me. I mean, in a sense, he was my first devotee friend. I've never used that language before, but I think I, I think that's fitting. I think he was my first devotee friend. Not that we were buddies, but he was a very kind, very friendly person, and he befriended me. And so he was really my first devotee friend, and because we came from similar backgrounds. I had a very familiar, comfortable reference point that allowed me to kind of venture out into things that were very unfamiliar and very exotic. Some people love exotic things. I don't think I was one of them. And so,、uh, so I think my friendship with McConnell and and the fact that he was a, I think Krishna sent him to me because he was such a nice person. That it made it very, really painless to sort of start to get into Krishna consciousness. His association was so pleasing; he was just so kind and and, and thoughtful and、uh, friendly. And so, in thinking about Makanlal and、uh, how fortunate I was to have his association back then, and right now I, I didn't plan to use this opportunity to you know say heavy things, but but.、Um, I'm just having these realizations right now, and thinking about Makumbo. I'm actually having realizations about how important it is to make Krishna conscious familiar to people, and sort of user friendly, easy for people to adapt. And Amakunda, even though he was, you know, dressed traditionally Islam wise, but he was just such a nice guy, and、uh, he could understand me, understood what I was thinking. I, under- I understood him. It-, it made it so much easier and more pleasant. To take my first steps toward Krishna consciousness. So、uh, I am eternally grateful to Makunlal Bhakti Madhurya Govinda Goswami, and、uh, I think you know I'd request everyone to、uh, just take a a few moments to appreciate him and to honor him. Because by honoring him, we are honoring our tradition. We're honoring Krishna, and、uh, I think it, you know. There's obviously, there's obviously no doubt about his destination. I mean, obviously, he has a spectacular <laughs> future, uh, and uh, he gave his whole life to Krishna, and and he gave his whole life to Prabhupada, and he did it with no reservation. With no doubt, would never look back. He just he met Prabhupada. He learned about Krishna, 
And that was it. That was it. For the rest of his life, which was about 52 years or whatever it was, um, he was just, his whole life was nothing but Krishna consciousness. Happy, enthusiastic, faithful Krishna consciousness. And always helping others, always speaking to others. He was not at all, I'll just end with this, he was not at all the kind of person who got into just his own, you know, bhajan or his own this or that. I mean, he was just, he was gregarious. As I, as I always knew him, he was just uh, always kind, always friendly, always willing to help someone. Always philosophical, and like I said, uh, sort of deceptively, deceptively simple in his habits because he was very clever. He was a very smart guy and real sense of humor. So um, anyway, my eternal gratitude to McCunlo and um, I celebrate his life and I, and I congratulate him on his amazing future in Krishna consciousness.